Hello and welcome to the Home Assistant Podcast. This is episode number 71. And as usual, we have Phil. Hey, Phil. Hey, how's it going? Good. And Glenn. Hey, how's it? How's it, guys? Good. This episode is sponsored by Home Assistant Cloud by Nebukasa. Easily and securely access your local Home Assistant instance remotely for a small monthly fee that also supports the Home Assistant project. Configuration is via the user interface, so no fiddling with router settings, SSL certificates, or any YAML. So today we're going to talk about 0.114 and some other stuff. So let's get into it. There's some interesting updates on the Home Assistant companion app. We've had Robbie on the show in the past uh, to talk about what the uh, iPhone app brings in and such as a long time ago. Mm. But uh, they just put out a little blog post, uh, which you should check out on the on the Home Assistant blog. But uh, essentially, just putting out, hey, here's some of the new features. Here's some of the you know what's what's really cool coming out. I, I admittedly, I only skimmed the Android section. It sounds like there are a bunch of uh, updates, including uh, improvements on notifications, um, just the way sensors have come in yeah, for the phone itself. So uh, geolocation to say, hey, the phone, the, the device is here. Um, and, and keeping in mind that the Android uh, version has only recently started being uh, mm. developed, right? Also biometrics. So again, doing, uh, I'm not sure what it's called in the in the Android world, but the face ID equivalent, essentially, or, or you know, uh, touch ID equivalent. So yeah, touch uh, ID, st- yeah. St- standard yeah. biometrics again, right? Uh, so a lot of those features have now been uh, incorporated into the Android release. Um, on the iOS side of the house, there's been a ton of stability improvements from a notification perspective. They actually change it so you can actually stream HTTP, uh, so using HLS, so HTTP live streaming for video, mm-hmm. rather than uh, MJPEG, uh, which is a previous format that they uh, that So they this preferred. is for camera feeds and, and all that, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so it's it's actually that that part is actually really nice um th- there's also per action urls um which can be so for example just uh if you if you have specific urls open it won't kick you into safari to open to open up the browser oh so i'm guessing you know this is like when you're on facebook and you click a link to go to an external site exactly. instead of opening it up the safari browser it actually stays within the facebook app and then you can you know not leave that whole experience Correct, correct. Um, nice. And and so I, I don't know, you know, uh, I don't have a ton of stuff where I use that, but it's kind of kind of cool, I guess. To, That'd be uh, handy. I know I have um, like web panels on the sidebar in my home assistant that link to, you know, my, anything I'm running locally like Grafana or, you know, Decons, Vera, anything that's, you know, a web service in my local network. Well, so yeah. So will that work? K- kind of, kind of. So this is, this is relative URLs for Home Assistant, right? So uh, the example that they use is like slash Lovelace uh, dash tacos slash zero, right? So as you have different URLs there uh, that you may have hard coded in it, it'll actually go into right. Okay. In because, the app. So previously, like, so if you're on the Home Assistant web page, you know, on your computer, yeah. you, they would just be, you know, it would just load the URL onto Lovelace, right? Because you're just browsing a web page. Mm-hmm. But I'm guessing previously. If you clicked a link, then Lovelace was, or the, the app was assuming that you were going to a web address and then throwing you out of the app. Right, right, exactly. Right. So, exactly. So, that's a nice uh, piece in there. So, a little bit of enhancements there. More, they say it's more frequent sensor updates while you use the app, uh, which is really cool, but I don't know if that's going to take a hit on battery life or what have you. I, I know in the past they had kind of uh, reduced the amount of, uh, background updates and such because mm. of battery. Um, so I guess I'm guessing that they removed that because either batteries are getting better or that iOS just handles that a little bit better. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Again, I'm not an iOS developer, so I'm not sure which one that is. But um, this one and then this next update for me was kind of huge. There's no more duplicate integrations. So 
what that is, is if I re-add my phone, I'll get like Rohan's phone too, or Rohan's iPhone too. Um, oh, really? And, and yeah, so my girlfriend's phone right now in Home Assistant is whatever underscore two, because I mm. I, I, I was transitioning between um, apps and what have you. And and it was just super, super, super frustrating. And and, and I do the beta as well. So while, while I went from the beta to the uh, GA version, yeah, uh, basically I, I had that, uh, I had that issue where, you know, it's now iPhone 2, right? Uh, rather than just Rohan's iPhone or what have you. So that means I had to go in, change all of my automations, change all of my whatever. Um, or I could just go through, find the way, delete the... It's just more effort, right? I had the same problem. Yeah. Mm, I had the same problem with mine now, with the duplicate integrations. Uh, basically, I had, I had to delete the app for some reason and re-download it, and then I re-enrolled, and basically, boom, I had duplicate integrations, and I simply just went in and just deleted... Uh, the 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 others and uh, it was a it was a mission and a half to get that all going again. So I'm glad they sorted that out. Yeah, yeah, that was really so. Like and 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 you know they call out specifically the beta the beta beta devices as well, or so the beta app as well. Which mm. I I ran into this problem a couple of times while I was going between the beta and the uh, regular app. So it sounds like they're using you know like the unique identifier of the iPhone now. So if you sign into multiple instances of the app from the same phone instead of, you know, generating a new entity ID in Home Assistant, it will now use, okay, this is the same phone, different app with the same phone. Don't recreate those entities. Yeah, that's what that's what it sounds like. So it says the app registers its unique ID with Home Assistant, mm-hmm. uh, which means that when you reinstall or reset up the app, it should pick up the thing. So nice. what happens mm-hmm. is I think, I think the beta and the iTunes version just overwrite each other or the App Store version just overwrite mm-hmm. each other so that should be a single entity but i did i did remember i was actually running both at once that may that may have been with the mobile integration and the iphone integration in the past uh before they moved to a mobile device uh, standardized uh, integration yeah. between the two platforms yeah so uh i mean, I mean regardless I, I i don't i don't know if it'll never happen but i think i think the chances of it happening are a lot less now which is really nice. Last thing is, uh, from an iOS 14 perspective, uh, they're adding a bunch of, uh, or they're looking into using uh, widgets and you know what else they can do in that sense, right? Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is a work in progress already, or if it's just, uh, or if it's just you know kind of ideas. But uh, that will kind of be interesting to see. Apparently, iOS 14 is also introducing local push connectivity, uh, which is essentially push notifications that are done locally, which is kind of cool. So it doesn't need to round trip up to Apple and then come back down. That would be much faster. I think that is something that they've wanted to put into iPhone since day one. People wanted Mm -hmm. local push, and then the alternative was uh, server push notifications. So it's quite interesting to see that that's actually coming in, uh, what's it, 14 years later? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's it's interesting because they even have, uh, you know, they, they even talk about like, you know, it's, hopefully it'll improve the experience for, especially for folks with boats and RVs and such, right? And 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 we've talked about both mm. kinds uh, in in our in our podcast where, you know, hey, here's someone with a boat that's trying to do so and so and so, right? And then and now again, if you're in the middle of somewhere, a lot of your notifications don't work. A lot of what whatever right your like voice you, assistants you don't work yeah 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 exactly so having local push is super handy in that sense um i think particularly for devices you know like emergency devices you know like smoke detectors carbon monoxide sensors if you have to rely on a cloud being you know online to then ping everyone's phone in that emergency when that alarm goes off it sort mm-hmm. of defeats the purpose right yeah, well, exactly, right. So, um, one other change, and this came in through another another uh, blog post as well from Robbie, is um, the iOS companion app is actually moving to uh, being branded as uh, from from Navicasa, mm. um, and essentially what that is is it it opens up a lot of possibilities for the app itself, right, and. Uh, in the sense of there's a, there's a lot of limits on individual developer accounts that you can do. That means making collaboration is difficult, so on and so forth, right? Um, and and essentially what Robbie's point in this blog post was is that um, if you know if there was an update that was needed or so on and so forth, they had to wait on Robbie, mm-hmm. right? Whereas uh, putting it in this, so it comes in as Nabucasa. That doesn't mean that it's you know that you need a subscription. It doesn't mean any of that. They just needed a legal entity to. Uh, 
register the app, app against. Yeah, right? They, they um, essentially needed a, a business developer's account through Apple, which correct. you can't get as a person. You need like, you know, in Australia, we call it an ABN number, like a business number. You would need like a, mm-hmm. a business ide- uh, identification number for exactly. Apple to give you, you know, that sort of developer account. Exactly. And, and, and Navicasa is that, right? They are a legal operating entity, mm. whatever you want to call it, right? Um, that doesn't mean that there's going to be a charge for the app. That doesn't mean any of that stuff. So just make sure that, you know, we're, we're clear on that, right? Um, when I first saw the tweet, I must admit, I thought, oh, no, they're going to, you know, require a Navicasa subscription for users. I thought, oh, no, that's not going to look good. But when you actually get down to the crux of it, it's literally just moving Git repositories, right? Like we need to change the ownership of who owns the code. And to do that, we're going to need people to, I think they need to re-enter their password when the new update comes through just to confirm that it's coming from a new source. Yeah. Yeah. There's, and, 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 and exactly. Right. And so with that, I mean, really not a lot should change functionally or anything like that. It just, it just makes it easier for the developers on the back end to, uh, to manage it. Mm. Um, at, as of the time of this recording, that hasn't been flipped over yet, I don't believe. Um, so, and, 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 you know, the blog post says they don't expect it before August 10th, which again, at the time of recording for me is tomorrow, uh, <laughs> for Phil who lives in the future is now. Yes. Uh, but again, that's not that it's not like that's a hard date, right? That that's their expectations. So Plus take it's that Apple, right? Apple could find, you know, that you're using some random API that they don't like anymore and bam, there's exactly. delay. Exactly. So, so that's going to take a little bit of time. Um, so, but that, that, but that's kind of what's happening in the, uh, in the mobile front, uh, mm. with the companion app, uh, that, that the team has put together. I do hope if, uh, they're going to add widgets to iOS that they at least add the same widgets to Android because Android's had widgets for years. And yeah, I just feel as though we would have the superior widget experience anyway. Yeah, I, I don't personally. I don't know how I feel about the widgets. I, I even on Android, I always thought they were kind of ugly. Um, really, and and it's like and, Lovelace for your home screen. They're, they're super handy. Don't get me wrong. I just I just hate the look of them personally. And and this is just one yeah. of those really weird me preference, like my personal preference things. Yeah, yeah. Um. I mean, with that said, will I have widgets when it comes out? Probably. <laughs> on my home screen, <laughs> right. Um. But yeah, it, it's it's. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm just not a fan of the way they look. Of course, we've got to try them out. I mean, hell, a new feature comes out. We've got to, got to give it a shot and see if, see if it's nice. I mean, it's probably a novelty that will wear off and we'll go back to uh, the good old home screen with all the icons on it. Um, but, you know, hey, got to try it, see if it works. Yeah. Hopefully we could do some cool stuff with it with Home Assistant. Uh, I see it as a, as a win. So, yeah, we'll give it a shot. Agreed. Agreed. So, um yeah, I mean, and I'd I'd love to see what what's uh, happening on that front there too, right? And and again, that that's some of the stuff that they were kind of saying that they're you know we're looking forward to where this is going, not necessarily mm. that hey you're going to get widgets by the time iOS 14 drops, right? So <laughs> just just to level set because I, I I I can already you know see people uh, tweeting at Robbie going hey you said this and so just <laughs> just just to make that clear, um, it is it is a work in progress, right? Or or just ideas that they're thinking of doing. Yeah. All right. So Home Assistant 0.114 is out today and we have some new features and it seems to be the the flavor going on at the moment, but Lovelace has joined the dark side and if you upgrade this time, uh, what's gonna happen is if your device, so if you're using I'm not sure if Windows has it yet i know mac definitely has it mac os has it if you have dark mode enabled on your uh, device when you open home assistant it is going to uh, load the the dark theme of home assistant so that also brings in a whole bunch of new uh, color options to the user interface so from the ui you can go in and choose colors you know like secondary colors primary colors you know what color should buttons be etc uh, without needing to touch any YAML. So previously, if you wanted to That's awesome. do some like theming of Home Assistant, you know, you may see on Reddit or Twitter, you know, some cool screenshots of people, you know, doing some themes to their Home Assistant instance. Previously, that was done through um, themes, which are all done through YAML. But now there are some, uh, not all the options are available, but most of the options are there where you can choose colors in the user interface and, and get it in real time feedback of what it's going to look like. So. That's great. That's I, I wonder if that's exportable. Um, I guess it is because it just dumps it into UI Lovelace right at, at some point. And then I haven't uh, seen, I, 
Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't gone into that button yet because I used like all my YAML files are like have themes in them anyway. Yeah, but yeah, that'll be interesting. Because because I'm thinking somebody comes up even even you know not necessarily a, I don't want to call it like a full theme theme, but somebody comes mm. up with a cool color scheme and it's like, hey, you know, I like that. What what did you do? And I don't want to have to go in and you know color pick every single or entity screenshot or it. every single. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So hopefully that'll be. Yeah. That's uh, that's a thing that's there as well. So, and what if they're going to allow you to assign a theme for dark mode and then a theme a theme for light mode? Uh, that would be qu- actually quite cool. So you can actually do your own themes. I wonder if they'll allow that. Mm-hmm. So there is uh, the ability for you know to, you to just call a service to set a theme against your home as an instance. Yeah. And as part of that, they have added a new attribute that allows you to specify a dark theme version. So, for example, you may have you know a theme called Glenn's, you know, Lovelace, right? And you have a day version and a night version. And depending on, you know, if your computer's in night mode or day mode, your Glenn theme will be loaded with the correct one. Oh, that's cool. That is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Repeat and choose options are now available in the UI automation editor. So uh, in the sense that we we talked last week about, or last episode, sorry, about uh, what some of the biggest changes are in automations and scripts. Um, and we talked about the chooser and the repeat abilities as well. Uh, so that from an automation editor perspective and, and, and a script editor perspective has now been ported towards to the uh, UI as well. Nice. Uh, something that caught me out in the in the beta is uh, changes to the automation turn off service. Uh, so right now uh, there is the ability for users to turn off an automation from yep. the front end. You know we're all familiar with that. Uh, and what happens now is when an automation is turned off, any running executions of that automation will also be stopped. They'll be killed mid process, and this actually caught me out where I have some automations that one of the first actions it does is it turns itself off just so there's no race conditions. You know, I have a couple of motion sensors that could do the same automation, but I don't want the automation to go off twice very quickly. Uh, so I would, my first action would be to turn the automation off. And of course, when I upgraded, the first thing that would happen is that it would turn itself off, but it would just kill itself, basically committing suicide. Wow. Uh, so there is a new flag that you'll need to add uh, to your automation turn off service. I think it's uh, stop underscore actions. You'll need to set that to false. It now defaults to true as of this release. That that's, that's really only affects it when you're mid automation though, right? Correct, okay. yes. But I can definitely see a use case for this because if you're using the repeat, now I cannot recall whether you can specify an indefinite repeat yeah. uh, condition. So if you're doing an indefinite repeat and you say something that sends out uh, alerts or notifications yeah. every, f- and uh, you want to be able to stop that and exactly, by simply turning yeah. off the automation, boom, it takes it out. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. I think this is where the this has sort of come out from. Some more some more speed improvements uh, have have come along as well. So uh, it's like there's a war on speed. So uh, which is which I'm all for. Um, make it more yeah, efficient, even better. Totally. Uh, so loading reloading YAML configs and and group availability should be a lot faster now. So great. Uh, and something that I always wondered why was it in Home Assistant, but here we go. It's finally here. AccuWeather is integrating with Home Assistant. They're a very popular weather service and I'm always on the hunt for a new dark sky replacement because I know that's eventually going to get killed off next year thanks to Rohan's friends Apple. That's right. So uh, good to see another weather platform come in. I'd like to see even more just so there's uh, more options. But yeah, cool. If you want, if you're looking for an alternative AccuWeather, I think would be a good one to start with. Yeah, I'm looking forward to trying it out. Uh, I actually wonder why nr. Uh, what's it? Wire. No hasn't been made a full blown integration like uh, like uh, Dark Sky or mm. AccuWeather because uh, Wire. No is actually pretty good. I, I quite use I, I use the app and uh, we call if if they brought that in as a full blown integration. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if there's a maybe there's a lack of an API or something like that that would. Mm, uh, that's probably the case. Yeah. Uh, control four. Uh, so if you run control four, uh, with at least OS 3.0, uh, you can now bring in your lights. So there you go. Yeah, I think, I think that's pretty cool. I mean, OS 3 got released last year yeah. and, um, it's, uh, the, the, the whole UI has been re redone and it looks a bit mm. sort of more up to date. Um, but it's quite interesting that now you can actually integrate into it. Um, I didn't think that was really possible before that. So I think it's a, it's a huge step forward. Yes. 
usually like a closed off system. Yeah, right? it, it is a closed off. And and the nice thing about this is is that you if you purchase a, a house and you're somebody who is into home assistant, you've got Control Four installed, and uh, hell, it, now you can just plug straight into it yeah. and and you can now do your own thing. Yeah, because, uh, yeah. Control Four is very closed, and I've actually got a friend who, who installed Control Four in in 2018 in March, actually, and um, so I've had a bit of an opportunity to play play around with it and, and just see the hardware and everything. So, mm. but uh, you know, once I got into Home Assistant, I thought, mm, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Control Four is a yeah. little, little expensive for my taste, but uh, yeah, it, it's they, they do have a really cool expensive. platform. I'm not I'm zero. Mm doubts on that but yeah the, the the cost was for me personally was a barrier yeah no it's it's um it's not cheap and i know how much yeah. you paid for it and and um i mean it's but but i think we'll we'll speak about this later but the the lighting and the hardware is just something else yeah uh, yeah I've, that's something that i really like yeah mm-hmm. all right um some noteworthy updates so HomeKit now supports doorbells and multiple camera streams so and this probably might go similar to the where you were going before, Rahan, with the updates to the iOS app. You know, it's, you know, better uh, mm-hmm. codec handling for cameras and stuff. So cool to see, um, you know, more HomeKit love being added. Yeah, exactly. I wonder what other home. I wonder what other HomeKit uh, features they still need to add. It just feels like they've added everything already. <laughs> it, sure. I know, every release, there seems to be something HomeKit. Yeah. Uh, like, well, there was a yeah. while where. One release after the other after the other. There was like mm. three, four HomeKit updates every every release, right? So, uh, you know, whoever's adding those in, awesome. Thank you. That's that's uh, you know, maybe they're just trickling them out to troll us. No, that's, yeah, that's right. And the, the the cameras was quite a big deal. I mean, the cameras was was took quite a long time mm-hmm. to come in, and when they brought that in, I thought, ah, there we go. We're now on the uh, definitely on the home straight. Um, I'm not sure what else they're still going to do, but I think it's fantastic. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, for automations, you can now have multiple time triggers, which is kind of handy. Uh, so if you use a time trigger, t- sorry, if you use time as a trigger in, in automations before you'd have to do multiple time blocks, now you can just have it all in one and it can accept multiple times for the at attribute. Uh, that's, awesome. yeah, it just means, just means less typing of stuff that you have to do. Right. So, uh, the pie hole integration now has a start and stop switch, which will get added to home assistant so it's a new entity when you boot up the 0.114 that means it's a fully functional switch in home nice. assistant so you can uh put it as you know you can expose it to your favorite voice assistant and then have you know hey amazon turn off ad blocking and it will work so not that you would ever want to do that yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd probably say the opposite hey turn on ad block yeah <laughs> Um, which also sort of leads us into the breaking changes. So as part of that, uh, the uh, enable service for Pi-hole right. has been removed. So if you were automating your ad blocking, so maybe, you know, uh, if you have a, an automation setup when your TV turns on to turn ad blocking on and then off when you turn it off, you will need to update that automation just so it uses the switch instead of that uh, enable service. Um, also, Meteo France, uh, which is uh, the French meteorological service, I guess, uh, is moving to an API, which is really good to hear. Uh, so, But the result of that is sensors and attributes are no longer available. Um, so they're used to use web scraping to f- get the data, um, which, you know, we... I think is banned now, yeah. isn't it? Like one of the rules in home assistant no web scraping Get yeah and, and and i think that's from the new integrations perspective i don't know if they've mm. gone back and said you know apps like uh like this one. Oh, there was a time where they were like a whole bunch got removed at once right like they just killed them yeah all. exactly but but I, i'm not sure why this one made made the cut mm. or or whatever but you know regardless <clears throat> they're using an API now, which is a more uh, reliable approach, right? Because what happens before is if you're web scraping, what happens if the web developer changes the UI of the of the site, right? Um, yeah. So now that's it's it's no longer you know working, or, 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 or if a button moves from let's call it button A to button B from a name perspective, great, your entire script's broken, right? So yeah. this uh, you know way more scalable, way more. Uh, way less breaking uh, unless and until mm. they change the API itself. So, which is you know, for the better. But I think they've also in the transition, there's going to be a few sensors and attributes that have changed along yeah. with it, which will be annoying for some people. But. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, 
you, you got to take the bad with the good, right? I guess so. Yeah. All right. Let me try and explain this one. So, <laughs> uh, shell commands in Home Assistant. So, Home Assistant has the ability to run, you know, command line prompts or command line commands from Home Assistant. So you can, you know, run any command that you can from a terminal inside Home Assistant. I use it a lot to do uh, curl requests to other web services. Uh, now, previously, if you were to fire a shell command, Home Assistant would allow them to run indefinitely. There would be, you know, if you had a, a download that took two hours from a curl request, Home Assistant would let it run for two hours. And, you know, if they build up, it could potentially cause you know, a lot of problems. So all shell commands are now limited to 60 seconds. I couldn't see in the docs if they're if that's configurable. So if you have like a, a really slow API that you're communicating with, it might take two minutes to respond. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if you can configure that, but it is something just to be wary of as well. And and just to add to that as well, so command line cover, command line notify and switch platforms now time out after 15 seconds as well. So something mm. important to note there. I wonder why the time difference, I guess that's, I mean, I guess if you're telling a, a blind to open, you don't need to wait a minute for it to respond. Hopefully. Uh, or yeah. you, you <laughs> might want to look at a new blind solution. <laughs> Uh, all right, so Glenn, this is where we uh, throw it over to you. So I guess um, first we should start off. You know, you've obviously got that very strong accent. If people haven't recognised, where where are you from in the world? Um, from Cape Town, South Africa. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, Cape Town. And you know, as I as I look out my window, I can I can see Table Mountain, of, of, you know, which is one of the seven wonders of the world. Unfortunately, it's covered with clouds and <laughs> and so forth. So I can't even point the camera to uh, to you guys. But hey, yeah, it's a great city. I love love enjoying living here. It's yeah, it's awesome. That's awesome. And there's a national park yeah. with that too, isn't there? Yeah, the Table Mountain National Park. That's awesome. Yeah. So there's a lot of hiking trails and. Of course, a big favorite is climbing uh, Lion's Head, and you just see the view of the city, and it's really awesome. Beautiful. A lot of, lot of great hike and Table Mountain, the cable car, and yeah, it's really awesome. That's great. Mm. So I guess we should start, you know, what sort of got you into Home Assistant? Yeah, well, look, um, you know, home, is home automation in general, I mean, I've always been very fascinated with uh, computers being able to control stuff, you know, hardware and so forth. And I think it came from when I was a kid. I mean, back back there in, in the 80s, there was this program on TV, which uh, they, they focused on the programming language of Logo. It's the, I don't know if, if that is perhaps a little bit uh, before your time, but it's a little turtle on the screen and you type a command like FD50 and it moves 50 oh, pixels up. Right. And yeah, nice. On, on, on this on this TV show, they actually had it connected to a robot. So you would type in a command, and this little robot would move uh, how many paces forward. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. So computers controlling things that that really was this, the sort of the, the the seed that was planted even back when I was a kid. And and you know, as as time has gone by, I mean, I've uh, you know sort of dipped in and out of of anything to do with home automation. I mean, in two thousand and and three, I met a guy who's who built this really big house. Um, in Cape Town somewhere who at the time was running kilometers of, of, of Ethernet cable through his house and, and automating everything. And I mean, back then it was mm. X10 and, and these really yeah. uh, archaic protocols. And I, and I actually ha- really hadn't had the chance to ask him, look, so how did you actually do it? Because looking at what we can do now, it's chalk and cheese, if one can call it that. Right, and, right. <laughs> and then... Um, and then I also I listened to a podcast called the HD TV and Home Theater podcast with Ara Dedarian and, and Braden Russell, and mm-hmm. they started getting into home automation with Insteon, and and I just was absolute in envy of what they were doing with Insteon. I mean, we're talking about oh, I, I don't even know. I think it was 2010 or 2011. Or I don't know when when Insteon came out, mm-hmm. and and I've been wanting to to import a lot of these devices because when I Look at what I can find here locally. It's nothing. I ca- you just can't find anything. You have to import everything because it's so niche. And mm. um, or you go with the, the the sort of brands like the Control Fours and the Crestrons of the world. But that's like completely out of our out, out of our budgets and, yeah. and means. And um, and I just well, Insteon they only work on on one ten volts, and we got a two twenty volt. Uh, so I couldn't even import the Insteon uh, stuff because I quite like at the time the way they were doing it and um you know so uh, the years rolled on and um 
and this is where I'm going to probably also talk about I'll talk about the lighting in a, in a second. But I was I was introduced to a, a company called Quick Switch here in South Africa. It's a local company that does um, relays and so forth. Mm, I thought, cool. oh, this is really cool. Yeah, and. And then it was uh, it was probably about a, a year, I think in 2017, when I actually bought a quick set relay and and a you know I thought let's let's play with this. I mean I I heard of Home Assistant, but I never really knew much about it. And then it was actually only in March, sort of February March in 2018, when I actually bit the bullet and said, okay, let's do this. We're now going to get into this 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 Home Assistant thing and see what it's about. I managed to get it up and running, and and suddenly it was like. Holy moly, but the possibilities of just becoming endless <laughs> yeah. here. Okay, this is, this is something that's going to be awesome. Yeah, and that's how I got into it. And uh, it hasn't stopped from there. And, and it's just been going forward ever since. That's awesome. So you've been, you've been kind of in the home automation game for a, a little bit at least then. Yeah, sort of just keeping an eye on things and, and seeing what's going on and watching the evolution of home automation. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's quite funny that uh, Braden and Ara on their podcast will say, yeah, this is the year of home automation. Yeah, because yeah. a lot of things like the, the Amazon Echo started coming out and, and they started getting features where you can control devices. And of course, all the, the smart home devices coming out are saying you can control it with, with the Amazon Echo, with Google Home. And, you know, and so and so this ball have started rolling and rolling and collecting more snow as it, as, as it's coming down the hill, just in terms of the amount of devices coming out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 2018, that, that was basically my, I can I can actually start to do this now because it's now becoming uh, feasible. And the nice thing is is that when I when I just dis, uh, dis, because I think what got me to discover Home Assistant was when I looked at Quick Switch and I said I need because at the time I looked at Quick Switch they they you could only they had a, a GSM uh, a device which would mm-hmm. send uh, commands to their cloud and. Uh, you know, it, it looked a bit bulky at the time. It wasn't really that great, the aesthetics. It's a GSM, so you're basically running a, a 2G phone connection for to get access to their cloud. Yeah. Yes, that was at the time. This was in 2016. And I thought, no, 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 no. This just So I kind of left it. And then when I, when I got back to them a year later, they had improved it by actually introducing a, a, a small hub um, called a Wi-Fi bridge, which allows uh, the devices to connect to their cloud. And then... And then when I got into Home Assistant, I discovered, but wait a minute, the, the, things are getting done a little differently because Quick Switch, there is an integration into, into Home Assistant with the Quick Switch. It actually came in quite early in, in, the, in the life of, of Home Assistant. And I see it used this little device called a QS USB hub. And I thought, oh, what, but it's going. And I went to the website. I couldn't find it. I then contacted them. I said, hey, guys, this QS USB hub, I need one. He said, no, we don't make them anymore. I said, Surely you've got to have them. I need one. Yeah. He said, not a problem. I'll make one for you and I'll ship it to you. Sure. And I mean, I mean, quick switch is virtually down the road from my office. I mean, uh, but um, actually through a friend, I, I got, I got this QS, USB hub and I got everything going and, and suddenly, boom, I was able to now control these relays. I only had two relays at the time, just that I hooked up to a lamp that I played with. And I, I, I said, okay, this, this, this is definitely going to, this is definitely going to be my lighting solution and, and, and uh, going forward because now I can actually control this lot. Now <laughs> let's get started. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So you, you talked about, and, and, and not, not to switch topics back and forth like crazy here, but uh, we, we you talked about Control 4 and, and your, um, your, your friend, somebody you know has a Control 4 installation. Um, why, I, I mean, you, you mentioned you don't want to go that way because of costs. Were there any other barriers? Was there anything else? Um, yeah, look, when, when uh, my friend did his control, uh, control for system, it was actually at exactly the same time that I actually got into Home Assistant. Right. And, I, and, I, and I said to him, you know, because I would have wanted to be able to get him going on Home Assistant rather than actually go and spend uh, the money that he did on Control 4. But mm-hmm. it was also at the same time where I was trying to figure out lighting in general with with home automation yeah, yeah. and i i found i found the holy grail of lighting with control four and yeah. looking around at what lighting how lighting is done everywhere else in terms of of the smart home you know where you've got uh, uh, smart bulbs you've got smart switches you've got but i i in every sort of solution i found a flaw because if you, if you look at and, and this is where this is also why I picked uh, Quick Switch because uh, Quick Switch is giving me actually the ideal 
uh, sort of scenario because and maybe just I know I'm going a bit on a tangent because you've asked me about control four, but I'll, I'll get there in a second. But essentially, quick switch works that you wire in the relay uh, to a cluster of lights. So, for example, in my study, mm-hmm. in my lounge, in my kitchen, there is a relay in the roof that controls those lights. And the the the, the little QS USB hub. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's about the size of an Oreo cookie, and you plug it into the Raspberry Pi via the USB. There's a, a has I you know, Home Assistant add-on which which we put together for it, and it talks locally via an API locally to this QS USB, and then it emits a a, a radio signal. So. It's it's basically in the same sort of frequency range as uh, Z-Wave. So in okay in in South Africa, the Z-Wave frequency is um, is it's eight sixty. Yeah, it's eight sixty eight point four. That's the South African Z. Very close. I, I don't know why you know that, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, the, and the, and the thing is, the the quick switch's frequency is four hundred kilohertz below the Z-wave frequency, so it's a proprietary frequency. Oh, interesting. Um, it's proprietary, so it was a frequency that was allocated by our uh, communications, uh, uh, you know, mm. uh, ICASA, which is our communications association of South Africa, and so that's also why that you you don't get quick switch anywhere else in the world because imagine trying to. Have to. I mean, that's the problem that Z-Wave, I would think, has because there's so many frequencies all over the world with Z-Wave yeah. devices. I mean, I can't go and buy a Z-Wave device in Australia or the US because it's not going to work if I had a Z-Wave hub that was purchased here. So, the 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 quick switch frequency, it's it's nice and low. Uh, it's it's um, so that means it. You know, as compared to Zigbee, for instance, where Zigbee is 2.4 gigahertz, where, where yep. quick switches is 868, it could penetrate through walls. I mean, I've got a relay sitting, uh, controlling a cluster of lights basically below my office, which is on the first story of the house. My, my house has only got one story, uh, two stories, but the only room in the second story is my office. Right. And it's sitting below. And the QS USB is sitting in my lounge connected to my Raspberry Pi, and, it's in a, and it is able to control that relay. So and and the nice thing about this is that the physical switches are actually switch plates. So they've got either two or four buttons on and then you pair the button with the relay. So you can pair a button with five or say two or three relays got if you it. wanted to. So so when you push the button it turns the relay on or turns it off. And and essentially you rip out the old switch, the old traditional switch, you close the circuit and then you put the switch plate uh, switch plate over the the hole where the old switch was. So now you've got the best of both worlds. You can push a physical button to turn the lights mm. on and off and you can control it with home assistant. Right. So and and the, the 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 problem that I have with a lot of smart home devices especially is okay, smart bulbs uh you you've either got to uh, find a, a a switch that will turn them on and off yeah. because I I fully believe in the fact that you should have uh, the the traditional light switch and obviously to be able to turn them on and off physically because at the end of the day you're not the only one who's using your smart home it's your family it's your wife your kids your yep. um, your guests that that come and visit and you know at the same time you. Also, uh, and this is what I also like about the, the quick switch, is this, that you've got either two or four buttons. And um, so coming back to the Control 4 now, now Control 4 has got what they call keypads. And th- this is what I really, really, really wish we could have in with, with the devices that we can get today is the keypad where you can configure the keypad with whatever combination of buttons you want. You can rip out some buttons, put in a bigger mm-hmm. button, you can put in a rocker switch, you can, and those buttons simply control relays and turn those relays with the group of lights on and off. And then obviously you've got the, the, the controller, which is essentially the, the home, home control for controller, which obviously these relays connect to yeah. and, and they're all sort of, so, uh, you know, and I quite like that system, and that's what I found with Quick Switch. I said I've got uh, definitely the the best of both worlds. I've got the the sort of in quote keypad uh, capability where you've got the physical switch, and you can program the buttons wherever you like. It's physical hard buttons, and also I don't have a relay built into the switch. The the other thing that I noticed, especially in the US and probably in Canada as well, that one two by four inch switch box only contains one switch. If you look at even, I mean, the other, the other brands of smart switches that are very popular is obviously the, the Cassetta, uh, what's it? Yep, um, Lutron. Lutron Cassetta. Yep. 
uh, which also communicates locally to its hub and stuff like that. But the, the problem still stands that you've only got one switch. That means that if you want to add more physical switches, you have to uh, uh, actually put enough. For example, you know, I would I would go to uh, obviously the channels, the YouTube channels that I watch a lot, uh, quite quite a lot is Doctor Z's and uh, Doctor mm. Z's and the Hookup. And when they did their smart home tours, I noticed one very pertinent thing about the US: the way they do lights is that you can have four light switches, and they're all two by four inch boxes sitting right next to each yeah. other like this big rectangular of light switches. Yeah. That doesn't happen in, in South Africa. If you want four switches, you buy one two by four and you've got four physical lights, uh, toggle switches or rocker switches in one unit. Uh, so you can imagine the conduit coming down to that light switch uh, from an electrical point of view. It's like it's just a plethora of wires. But also- uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's pretty annoying. We're, we're, we're exactly the same here. Um, I, actually, you know what? For the most part, it's actually not bad. The neutrals are what's mm. annoying. <laughs> Because it'll just be one mm. giant uh, bundle of neutral cables, right? Yeah. And, and the, the other thing is that our houses, we don't use drywall in our houses. Not at all. It's all brick and mortar. Right. So, so basically when the house is built, when that uh, a conduit is put into the wall and that switches on the wall, that's, that's what it. You get. You, you, that's what yeah. you get. Yeah. You, get, you can't go and cut a hole in the drywall to put another switch in or whatever the case is. So, so if you go walk into the hardware store now at, uh, you know, anywhere in South Africa and you look at the switches they, they, um, they sell, it's um, one, two, four, and even six button switches, all in a two by four inch uh, switch enclosure. So, uh, you know, so that's why a lot of the times we can't really import a lot of the switches that that uh, you know right because we generally control what, uh, up to two i'd say most of my switches in my house are two and more i'd say two maybe four in, in uh, one box in some cases in one yeah. box yeah so uh, and and that, that's what i and and coming back to the control four system they also have just one it's also a two by four box a, a, a keypad with all the little buttons on it and obviously you can control all your lights with it and obviously they also sell those sort of decora style a uh, rocker type of switches yeah. and that's quite cool with the little leds that show you that it's on and off and all this all this cool stuff so yeah it's it's you know it's it's i, I you know at the beginning of my smart home journey i was a bit disillusioned as to what was out there i thought come on guys you you, <laughs> you, you need to get this right <laughs> And, I've, and Quick Switch is the only one that I found that actually really got it right. It's just a pity that, yeah. that they localized here. They can't get their products overseas because, I mean, the certifications to get their products yeah. certified all over the world would just cost an absolute fortune. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, we've got uh, clusters of lights that we need to control. We can't just go and replace them all with smart bulbs. And, I mean, it will cost a small fortune, you know. <laughs> yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, and and, and that's, that's what's unfortunate about uh, small companies like that right it's just it's it's hard for them to even though they're doing a lot of cool things it's it's hard for them to scale out um to do a, mm. a, a, something at a global scale right so which is which is oh, it's very very which is too bad so. but uh I, I, I know you were you were in, in your email to us you were talking about um you know load shedding uh, electricity uh, electrical load shedding uh, <laughs> prepaid electricity um you know Ooh, all, all yes. of the all of the challenges that are in in South Africa with with, with regards to electricity and water and, and and all of that. Yes, definitely. You know, you know that's that's one thing we not we not um, uh, uh, we're so used to uh, crises. You know, we've now we've now got the pandemic now, mm. but mm. Um, in because of the water crisis was the it? water cri yeah we, the the water crisis was around twenty it started coming from about twenty sixteen onwards where. Right. Mm -hmm. The, we weren't getting enough rain in Cape Town. This was localized to Cape Town, but actually it spread throughout the country as well. But it was very prominent in Cape Town. Um, we, the, we st our winter rains never came in 2016 and 2017. And our dams were, uh, that supply water to the city of Cape Town were starting to decrease. And Just we started getting... Up. It started drying up and, and they imposed very, very strict water restrictions. So basically, they would have different levels. So you're only allowed to use so much water. They started obviously charging you a lot more if you used more water. So, um, you know, it was this big water saving drive that we were going on trying to see if how many, how many kiloliters of water we can use a month, you know. So you would get in the shower, wet your body, turn the shower off, lather up and uh, it's rinse off done. Mm. I mean, you'd call it the one minute showers. And, 
and you know, and a lot of people had to impose a lot of creative ways to try and conserve water. You know, especially keeping our gardens going, keeping our pools topped up because we weren't allowed to top our pools up. We couldn't water our gardens um, and stuff like that. So a lot of us had we would install big uh, uh, rain rainwater collection yeah. tanks. So I've got two uh, one thousand liter rainwater collection tanks that I installed back then. And um, and also trying to find ways that we can even reuse our grey water. So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so of course, uh, um, next to the washing machine, I've got a big two hundred liter uh, tank. Uh, there's a submersible pump in there, and all the washing machine water gets uh, put in because I've got a big, you know, the Speed Queen washing machines, and and that thing really sucks water. So right. that tank is 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 fill, filled up by the time a wash is done. So, uh, you know. I, <laughs> um, now, what I did was I, uh, when um, when we did the tank, I think it was a 2019. I managed to get a whole lot of a lo- whole lot of Xiaomi sensors, and of course, one of them was a water leak uh, detector yeah. sensor. So I, I popped that. Uh, I popped that onto the tank, and uh, you know, I said about email. I got a couple of funny stories, and I thought I'd just get on get into this while we're on this yeah. topic. But um, so uh, the, the the leak detectors in, and I was still using the Aquara Hub. Yeah, and the Aquara Hub was sitting virtually uh, within ear distance from my lounge. So, uh, if the little the alarm that I set it so that if the the water leak detectors triggered, the alarm will go off. You would hear announcements on the Amazon Echoes all around the house. The notifications will get sent to all the cell phones, yeah. so that you know that the, this tank is overflowing because. Although we're very diligent in making sure that once the, the washing machine is done, uh, the tank is full, uh, we go plug a hose into the submersible pump and pump the water out and water the garden with grey water. You know, it, mm-hmm. I would say using grey water is not really the best for your garden, no. but at least it kept it on life support. It's something, you know? so yeah. It's just it's something, and um, you know, and there's and there's times when uh, we forget to turn off. First of all, because the submersible pump's got a float switch, so when the water goes down, the submersible turns off. And we've had a couple of cases where we forgot to unplug the submersible, so the washing would be get done, and suddenly you'd hear this big spray in the garage, and all our cars would get wet. And oh no! <laughs> but um, but coming back to the the leak detector now, um, it was one one Friday, and I was I was going home and, and uh, needed to stop at the shop to get some milk and, and so forth. So I'm in the line waiting to, for my turn to get to the till to pay for the milk and whatever else I was getting. So I get a notification on my cell phone to say this, the water le- detector has been, been uh, triggered. Has been, uh, uh, triggered. Yeah. And I think, okay, I know my wife's at home, so I phone her and I phone her and phone her and phone her. The phone does, just rings and rings and rings. She's not picking yeah. up. And oh, I thought, no. oh, jeez, <laughs> Okay. So, any case that I'm, and I'm drop the milk in the yeah. groceries. I was very close to drop the milk in the groceries, <laughs> but luckily I was the first. I was I was right in the front, so I'll just let it. I just thought, okay, let's just let's just get it done. I raced home, and as I was coming around the corner, I could start seeing the water coming down the driveway oh, no. and the gate. <laughs> and I I didn't even I didn't even put my car off. I opened the the, the driveway gate into the garage, shut down the, the the washing machine, and I went into the house and I said, love. The water tank is overflowing. Didn't you hear the, the siren go off? Didn't you see your phone? Yeah, Didn't yeah, you hear yeah, Alexa, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the echo go off? And she said, oh, but I thought it was part of the movie. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, because she was watching him. She was watching a movie with obviously you know, what, what, you know, because the, she heard the siren. She thought the siren was part of the movie she was watching. I said, "How can you not know? Oh, that's Didn't funny. you look at your phone?" See, and, now, now you know that if an alarm goes off as part of your automation, you need to pause all, all TV. <laughs> yes, exactly. Turn no. all TVs off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so of course, the first thing I do and goes, uh, I go and do is is, is put this this on a repeat to somehow call a script calling a script and I couldn't even could that couldn't even get that right. So I tell you I was like, oh man. But what I was quite happy about is that the automation triggered and it actually did its job. Yeah. So I was quite like re- no I, n- I never thought that I would ever get there. But um you know, you know <laughs> <laughs> and then um uh, one other uh, little project that I did is I just with the ESP8266 created a, a, just a, a, a tank level monitor as well, just for the fun of it, just to see if I can level measure the level of water in my rainwater collection mm. tanks, 
which was quite a fun project to do. Um, it never really got off the ground where I actually deployed it, but the sensors, actually, the pressure sensor is still sitting in my one tank is uh, enough. Uh, right. So, because I, I kind of thought my tanks, you know, especially when, because uh, we, we got our, our winter rains around about June, I think, then, then it came bucketing down with rain and we, and our dams are getting full and my tanks are always full. They were always full. So I thought, mm. I'm, I'm not so going to spend. need to know. Yeah, I don't need to know. You know, I mean, I use the water when I, when I, when I empty the tanks, I empty them into the pool. So just to top the pool up during the summer. So I don't really need to do that. It's cool and all, but yeah. Um, so, you know, that on the, on the, on the water side of it, and at some point I was even uh, considering getting a Moen, fl- I think the flow for Moen, I think yep. at that time was, was, I'm not sure if it, I think that I'd started seeing uh, articles about it, but I couldn't buy it because I wanted to measure my water consumption so we can really on a fly check to see if we're reaching our target so that we don't go over. And if we do go over, then something happens, alerts or whatever the case is. But, shut off the water. You know, yeah, shut off the water. Or, yeah. Right. yeah, you know, a lot of different things that I, that I wanted to do, but I thought, uh, you know, we – so that project got set aside. I mean, there's, there's water, there's water monitoring systems like the Moen is not cheap. I mean, no, I, I was actually um, looking at that when my water main broke and, uh, I just couldn't get it in time because my water main broke. <laughs> and I needed, yeah. I <laughs> it always happens water, when you don't know, so. when you don't know. Yeah, 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 so. <laughs> but, uh, oh, I tell you that that's, that's a really, it does look like a, a nice device. Um, so uh, oh, that, that'll be a future project. And I even considered building one with a little turbine and, and, and so forth. But you know, it's, it takes so much time just to get these things up and running and to build them. And uh, I thought, uh, let's just leave this for another day. Yeah. We'll, we'll focus on something else. But, um, yeah, the, the other thing that we've been having a problem with is load shedding. And this started happening uh, from about two, 20, 2008, where the, the country's generation capacity was actually starting to um, – in other words, the, the, the demand was actually exceeding the supply and they went mm. into a series of what they call rolling blackouts. So basically they divided the country into areas yeah. and different time slots. And then for two and a half hours, depending on the stage, so if stage one is a thousand megawatts, uh, at stage two is 2000, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And then they would cut your power for two and a half hours and that could happen once a day, once every two days. If it's stage Jeez. three, then it's, it could be two to three times a day. So, you know, obviously a lot of companies and a lot of private individuals started installing generators and inverter systems and so mm. forth. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, so with Home Assistant, what I, uh, what I discovered during, because uh, we, the load shedding at, at certain points would just stop. So t- the 2008 cycle lasted and then it stopped. And then um, maintenance, because it's because of lack of maintenance on our power generation uh, units and, and so forth that this started happening. And and um, so there was a, a period where it never happened. So that was great. So we, we could uh, actually forget about it. And then again, it started rearing its little head again in 2016 where we started getting load shedding. And then again in 20, you know, so it total goes on and off and on and off that they actually bring it back in. I mean, just before our, our lockdown, we were, we were going through a series of, of load shedding as well. And when I, what I noticed about load shedding is especially that 10 o'clock in the evening um, time that all the lights would go off and then the lights would come back on, the power come back on at half past 12 and all my lights would come back on as well. So, mm-hmm. All the, you know, especially the ones that are on the quick switch relays, because they res- they go back to their own state uh, mm. that they were on. So, at half past twelve, you realise the power is back on, and you've got to struggle through. Oh, now I've got to switch everything off and so forth. So, so there I created an automation um, that I I basically preloaded a Google Calendar with uh, with stages one to four in it with the times for my area. Mm-hmm. And in Home Assistant, uh, configured it so that depending on the stage, it would actually call a script to shut down. So it, first of all, turn off all the lights, shut down the computers, um, shut down Home Assistant itself, you know, shut down the Raspberry yeah. Pi. Right. And you know, try and shut down as much as I can so that when the power, when power comes, goes out. Yeah. yeah. So because the power doesn't go out at exactly that time, but usually it's about a couple of minutes after. So then at least it's home assistant's got time to shut everything down mm. so that when the power comes back on, you don't have to worry at, at two in the morning or whatever. That's only all your lights are all all on and, and everything. So, so, you know, it's those type of things that we had to take consideration of. Thank goodness that the, the Eskimo power supply company has got a little uh, restful web service that, that 
publishes the stage so that I right. added then as a as a sensor nice. home assistant. Yeah. Uh, how are you running like home assistant? You're using like the Raspberry Pi, and, and if you are, could you use something like a, a phone charger to keep home assistant running during those brownouts or blackouts? Um, yeah, look, it's running a Pi. So I've just recently upgraded to a Pi 4, cool. 4 gigabyte. Four, mm-hmm. uh, four gig, that's really awesome. As I tell you, from a 3B, uh, it's such a massive improvement. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I must say the Pi is, is, is running really nicely. And yes, I, I could do that. I, I mean, a lot of people invest in little inverter systems to keep their, um, so for example, to keep the internet up and running, you know, their, their, mm-hmm. their router, uh, so that you've got internet access. They uh, it pl- it obviously uh keeps their TV going and perhaps a streaming box or something like that. So at least, and a, and a single light. So, uh, you know, these are very small inverters that sit on the top of your TV cabinet. So, I mean, I could do something like that, but the, the problem that I have is that my network is scattered around the house. So in my office, I've got my fiber router um, down. Uh, my, my ubiquity access points are both plugged into a, a switch in my garage. So that's where the power for that is. And then the TV mm-hmm. and all, and the and then Nvidia Shield and all that is so. If I were to have an inverter, I would have to put three inverters throughout the house, yeah. and and for me that just doesn't doesn't really sit well with me. And so you know you kind of just yeah I'll just live with it. We'll just live with this. Um, I actually uh, just the other day I actually got a quote for the installation of an inverter system with a, a like a with a four hundred uh, amp hour battery. Um, to keep the lights on and the power mm-hmm. going within the house during during uh, these blackouts, and uh, uh, the price uh, was quite steep yeah. but expected. <laughs> um, the guy quoted me for a lithium ion battery, which is a lot more expensive than like a, a like a, a gel deep cycle batteries and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, we thought, mm, let's just live with this for now. You know, so um, it's not ideal, sure. but you know. Later, we, later we do that because a friend of mine um, actually candles are cheaper. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, candles and and gas, uh, That's and, right. you know, propane gas lamps and the, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah a lot cheaper than than and you know and the the only um, thing is that when there's a blackout, the cell networks virtually die as well. Oh. So you you really isolated. So you can't even oh, wow. access LTE. It's 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 not that's, fun. That's so interesting because that. that even from a safety perspective, that sounds because yeah. I would have thought those are like critical or whatever, exactly. and your it provider is. would have yeah. had some kind of backup it's, power it's, on those. But they, they've got backup batteries, but the thing is that they don't seem to be able to last to carry the load. So when the power goes out, you've still got a bit of a, 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 you've still got some a way to at least have four G or whatever the case is. But then eventually it just goes to a crawling halt. Uh, it's, mm. it's really terrible. You, you you feel like you're cut off from the rest of the world because right. you can't. <laughs> Uh, sometimes phone calls traditional phone calls sometimes do go through so that's a bit of a lifeline so at least those go through but i mean you know data is 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 the name of the game today yeah and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and if that's done uh, you're pretty isolated and from the rest of the world if so. everyone's yeah. power's gone out everyone's jumping on their phone onto facebook to well that's sort the of entertain other thing. themselves right and yeah because now now exactly, you have a surge yeah. of everyone on especially because it's area based Right where the where the mm. load shedding is, so everybody in that one area is now jamming up the cell towers too, right? So, yeah, and I think that's probably the cause is because this because everybody's jamming up the cell towers. That's probably also and that's another, and the obviously the backup power there at the cell towers is just not handling it. So, yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's a problem. But uh, you know, thank thankfully I know that that the the fiber network is uh, that's up and running because a lot of people have said that they yeah. they they at least. The, for their fibers is up and running so that's great so that i mean the node the node room which is down the road from me where where the, the network terminates basically is stacked full of batteries and stuff like that yeah so that's that's a good thing <laughs> yeah that's crazy that's uh those are yeah. some interesting challenges um it, it, it is um and and um, the other the other thing that we uh, especially a lot of newer homes that are built in in South Africa are built with uh, prepaid electricity meters. So yeah, you don't get a bill bill from council. You you got a meter in your garage. It's got an LCD display. It shows you how many uh, kilowatt hours you've got of electricity left. So when you want to top up, you purchase a token. You say you want uh, five hundred rands with electricity. It sends you a token. You punch the token in. Boom, your box gets up. Uh, comes up and 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 
my, my one big project that I've been, tr- been wanting to tackle and I actually did start it is to be able to read that LCD display because believe me, guys, I've been caught so many times where I forget to top the meter yeah. up and boom, the power goes out. It's like, oh, no, do we have load shedding? Oh, no, we no. don't have. I can you see all the street lights the on. <laughs> so is it actually attached to your house? Yes, it's basically in the main line. So that when the power comes into your house, it goes through the meter first before it actually yep. hits your distribution board and everything. Right. So um, you, you, you're pretty much at the mercy of this meter. So if it runs out and you forget to top it up, yeah, then, and then, so then you I'm have to on go my outside phone and I, in the cold and you have to go out in your nice – you know, nice dressing gown and, and, your, and your moccasins and, and punch in this code <laughs> to turn on, to get the power back on. Well, luckily the meter's in my garage. So, okay. so, that's, uh, that's, so the nice thing is that I, when I walk into the garage from the house, because right. obviously our garage is, uh, there's just an access door from the house into the garage. So, it's, so I just walk in, I can turn my head and or we just give my job, job to my son to check the meter. Mm. Hey, we still got some units left. There you go, you have and, automated uh, it. That's right. Yeah, I kind of have automated it in a way. Oh, so it's, but but one thing I did, I did, I got myself an ESP32 cam, and I loaded ESP Home on it, and I basically put it onto it just as a test, put it onto a tripod, mm-hmm. and and because the ESP32 cam has got a, a a flash, so you can turn on the globe and you can watch the meter. Sure. So I used the seven segment display yeah. uh, integration in Home Assistant to read that meter because then Home Assistant could give me an alert to say, hey, your meter, your, your electricity is running low, you need to top up. Um, now, sadly, these meters aren't smart. You, there's, there's no internet connection or anything. So you physically have to go and punch in the digits to, to top it up, which is, <laughs> yeah. Right. So at, at the end of the day, you can get these notifications, but you still got to actually physically go and purchase yeah. electricity and go and punch it in. Interesting and, that if um, they're not smart how do they know that the code's being used the, it's a quite an interesting uh, it's it's a f- interesting algorithm that they that they use because i haven't heard of anybody being able to to hack or to generate tokens yeah, um, you know as a, sounds guess, like i never yeah. heard of it ripe for i remember back yeah. in um like you know the phone like the freaking you know like putting up a, a little um, a phone generator, like a tone generator to a pay phone yes. to get free phone calls, right? Yeah, yeah. This sounds like these sort of people should be all over this. It's surprisingly not. And I have researched it quite quite a lot to see if somebody's ever done it. But apparently it's all to do with using um, encryption where they know your meter number because each meter's got a meter number. Mm-hmm. There is a key um, in, the, in the meter that is used to obviously decrypt yeah, uh, right. the, the, the token. So, so, um, so there is some sort and, of communication back to the utility provider. Not, not at all. There's no communication whatsoever. And you know, I mean, again, one could say, oh, but you could just bypass the meter by going in and bridging the sure. meter. Uh, but um, but I've, they do um, occasional audits of meters and stuff like that. Mm. And, and I, would, I would think that they would have systems in place that knows your purchase history, they, how regular you purchase. So if you're not purchasing for a long time, um, okay, there's something going yeah. on. Yeah, let's go and do an inspection. So, But these meters are completely offline. Uh, they're relying on the fact that there's some form of encryption that is preventing you from being able to decrypt the token and stuff like that. It's very proprietary. I, I've, I, I would love to know how these things work, but <laughs> I think it's a closely guarded secret because imagine sure, if somebody sure. had to exploit that. Which, yeah. which uh, again, I but, completely understand why, right? It's, it's, yeah, hmm. no, definitely. It's... Um, but uh, the, 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 what's, what was preventing me from continuing this project is that one would have to keep this camera exceptionally steady pointing at this meter. And I was looking for a gooseneck arm, you know, those sort of metal gooseneck mm-hmm. type of arms with a clamp and a base that you can attach to the wall that you can uh, steady this ESP32 cam at the display because obviously you don't want if it moves out by one pixel then then the seven segment yeah, display integration can't decode it. Yes. And I found a place uh, in the states called Snake Clamp and I thought oh this because I really try to look uh, locally for this and the only thing you can find are these things that hold up your tablet and sure. your phone and, 
And those, I can't think, are the most stable because you need something that's stable that is not going to move. And when I saw, when I calculated the price of this thing, how much it will cost to import it, I thought, no, 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 no. It was like over a thousand rand. I think that was even before the pandemic, before the, our currency yeah. tanked. So I can imagine it's, it's probably a lot more now. So again, another really pro- cool project, which I really couldn't wait to get, get off the ground. I put on hold for a bit. So, but I will eventually get there because it's a bane, it's a, it's just a bane of my existence just you wake up in the middle of the night and, and i see my amazon echo spot is off and i think oh no <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so i mean those are very very sort of uh, challenge a lot of sort of localized challenges that we have and how we are trying to get our home automation systems to to at least um, help a little bit in the way of of just alerting us about this and managing things and 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 stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So. I I wonder if the utility mm. is looking at doing something like again having something smart or with an app or something like that right where they change out the meter and and mm. it's a little more intelligent just to say hey by the way you're going to run out of power in whatever, right? Yeah, cuz I know in Australia a lot of this they've got smart meters now in our homes and they use like a, a Zigbee protocol, you know, just to yeah. communicate back to a base station, you know instead of having to send people out to read the meters of how much electricity is being used. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I seriously doubt we're going to have anything of that uh, of, of that nature anytime soon. I mean, the, the power utility company is so embroiled with uh, corruption and mismanagement and yeah. um, and so forth. So the chances, they they need to save themselves first before they can even think of doing fair, stuff like fair. this. Fair, so. that's, that's <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate. So in the meantime, we just got to uh, go out and install some form of inverter system just to keep our power on. So the nice thing about the, having an inverter system that if the meter runs out, you can... You can, because the, the nice thing about the inverter system, the inverters they they sell mostly in in South Africa is made by a Chinese company called Voltronic. It's the expert mm-hmm. inverters, and you actually get a Docker image that. Um, uh, which, uh, which you connect to Raspberry Pi to the USB port, and then uh, via MQTT you can then monitor a whole lot of uh, oh, that's stats nice. and information. Okay. So there you, you will get the information about okay, it switched from grid power to battery power, or from PV power, or whatever yeah. the case is. So you know, using all that. I mean, th- that's why I actually want to get an inverter system because I can play that's with right. all this cool that's stuff. Right. You know, <laughs> yes, also just to keep the lights on doing load shedding. <laughs> Yeah. And then you can have automations like when you switch off, you know, your grid power, you turn off. Yeah, the, turn off the, the main thing. Yeah. The, uh-oh. Did we lose them? Uh, I think so. That is an awkward time to freeze. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> he's just had a blackout. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's uh yeah, power shed. <laughs> he hasn't paid his uh, electricity today. <laughs> Oh, no. All right. I don't know. What what happened there? We, we were just saying that you, you must have forgot to put the money in the meter and <laughs> gone, had a blackout. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, you know that you, you joke like that, but it's actually very possible. Thank goodness I checked the meter before the recording and we still a lot of off. And, and sometimes we've actually had a case where they they tell us, oh, by the way, we're going to now start load shedding and boom, the power goes out like within oh, wow. minutes. So it's, uh, if, if it happened, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Yeah. Well, I guess that's probably a good time anyway to, to sort of wrap up. Um, Glenn, thank you so much for coming on, uh, talking about your unique use cases and, and requirements for your smart home in South Africa. Yeah, no, uh, thanks very much. I mean, I've got still so many stories to tell and, and so forth, but I guess we're running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> we'll speak to you soon. Yeah. No, thanks very much. It was great. Thank you. Cheers. If you want to share your home assistant journey or come on as a guest, reach out to us at feedback at haspodcast.io. That's H-A-S-S podcast.io. The Home Assistant Podcast is hosted by Phil Hawthorne and myself, Rowan Caramandi. For links to topics that we discussed today, check out our show notes on haspodcast.io. Podcast.io.